We're going to begin with this. A man went to a doctor and he says, Doc, I'm having trouble remembering things. I can't find my keys. I go into a room and I get there and I forget why I came in this room. He says, I, it's really, really bothering me. I need your help. What do you think I should do? So the doctor took in that information and he, he had this great sensitivity in his face and in his tone. And he said, pay me in advance. We began that Wednesday night to study a section of 2 Peter where Peter says that he uh, does not apologize for reminding Christians about some things. And, and we began our study by just looking at a number of passages about remembering and how important it is to remember, and, and David's thoughts fit well with all of that. But it just got me to thinking about how important it is for us to remember and how significant our, our memory is in motivating us in our spiritual walk. And we're going to do a little memory test. Okay, and here, here's the, the first. What TV series holds the record for broadcasting the highest number of episodes? Here's a clue. Gunsmoke, yeah. Um, over 600 and some episodes of, I think is what it said, Gunsmoke has said. Uh, okay, very good. Good memories. Let's try this one. What was broadcast on June 26th, 1951? Now, that's even before my time. What was broadcast? The very first color television program. And it was called World, uh, The World is Yours. You were close to him. You had the world in it. 30 minutes, Monday through Friday, featured a Scotsman who was a naturalist and also an actor. And I think he became a producer, produced some things like the Gary Moore show and some of those things that were in the early years of TV. Okay. We didn't do so well there. How about this one? We'll get up a little a little. A little more into, you know, probably like uh, Drew's time now. What was unique about Billy Joel's album entitled 52nd Street? Ooh, the very first CD. Sony released, along with his album, their first CD player. Very first CD. Okay, the young people are going, oh, come on, Dan, come into the 21st century. So here we are. What year was the first mobile phone used? 56? Oh. 71. Nineteen oh eight it was conceived in thought, in diagram, and in concept, but it was not produced. And that was in America. But in nineteen eighteen, the Germans tested a wireless phone, and in nineteen twenty six they began to offer wireless phone service to first class people riding the train. In 27, cartoonist Carl Arnold published this in a Berlin paper. Do you see the mobile phones? Okay, this three season TV program featured a two deck spaceship connected by an elevator. The ship was propelled by nuclear power and provided anti-gravity living environment. Star Trek. I knew there'd be a bunch of folks jump on that one. But the, the Star Trekkers are wrong, and it was lost in space. Uh, 
I'm sorry, that, that probably wasn't a real good fair test of your uh, memory. But here's one more, one more question. In the program Lost in Space, there was a robot who really didn't have a name. Once in a while, he got called Robot B9. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. The premise of that TV program, Lost in Space, was that this family was put in this spaceship and they were frozen. And they were sent off into space and they were going to travel for light years into space. But they ran into a meteor shower and it messed all the guidance system up and the people unthawed and they didn't had they didn't had no idea where they were and the whole premise of the program from that point on was they didn't know where they were they were lost in space and there were all kinds of aliens and remember that dr martin the he was always fighting with the robot you know you bubble-headed idiot you know and he's all these sayings that he had look it up on the internet it's there okay i'm not making it up When those people lost memory of where they were, they were lost. When you and I lose memory of where we are spiritually, we're not lost in space, we're lost in faith. And we may go the right place, we may engage in the right activities, but if we're not remembering, then it's entirely possible that we're going through a lot of motion, but that we have lost our, our way. When we don't remember, Danger is present. I put this in the front of the bulletin. I found it extremely fascinating that this medical doctor, Dr. Korn, said, to exist without memory can be to, life, to live a life that is, in a sense, anesthetized. When anesthesiologists first used ether, the gas was heralded as eliminating both experience and memory. So you don't feel the pain because you don't remember and you don't have the experience. That's, that's what sometimes happens to us spiritually. If we don't remember, we become, if you will, anesthetized in our spiritual walk. Active memory has always been at the root of spiritual success and spiritual development. Peter, as I've already mentioned, shares how important that is. Therefore, he says, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them. You know what that says? That says we, we better be repeating this stuff. It's not that we just need to hear it once. Peter says, I'm going to continue to remind you, even though you know it, we need to be reminded. And then he says, and are standing firm in the truth that you've been taught. It's only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live, for our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I will work hard to make sure that you always remember these things after I'm gone. Four verses and three of the verses, Peter says, remember, remember. I'm going to go, I'm going to die, but I'm going to, I'm going to work so that you remember these things. Peter found memory to be important. And Paul, just like Peter, writing to Timothy, knowing that the time of his departure was at hand, knowing that he too was writing, if you will, his final words, he also makes the same point. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffered hardship, even the imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things, for the sake of those who are chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. I want to suggest that in the message that Paul gives to Timothy, there are three things, three spiritual truths that he identifies that are worth remembering. And the question for us is how, how well are we remembering those things in our own spiritual walk? Are we keeping from becoming lost in faith? And the first one is this. Paul tells Timothy, I want you to remember God's son. 
I want you to remember God's son. Specifically, here's what he says. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. I want you to remember Jesus Christ. When you are challenged just to remember the son of God, I'm sure there are all kinds of things that you think about, that you recall about Jesus. Let's try to reduce, reduce those to a single word. To a single word, a memory that you have of Christ. Give me some of them. Savior. Savior. Faith. Love. Friend. Redeemer. Sinless. See, we have, no, we have no, it's easy for us to come up with words that, rec, that show us how we remember Jesus. There are many great things that we remember about our Redeemer. I do, however, want to, to suggest something to you, that in the context in which Paul shares this with Timothy, remember this is his final letter, this is his his swan song to Timothy, his son in the faith, who has become timid, and he has encouraged him already to fan his faith into, into flame again. And as he writes in this second chapter, he's, he set a context earlier. Let's look at it. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. It seems to me that if we look at the context in which Paul shares this with Timothy, it's within the context of suffering. And it may be that what Paul wants Timothy to remember, and remember so much of this, this second letter is about enduring, suffering, people not holding on to faith any longer, and how Timothy is supposed to respond to all of that. As this letter addresses those things, it may be that when Paul says, I want you to remember Jesus Christ, he said, I want you to remember his suffering. And the reason I want you to remember his suffering is because that gives you a perspective on yours. If you remember Jesus Christ, who came, who suffered, who endured during your times of trial, compare your sufferings to his, and guess who will win the suffering comparison? The man of sorrow will. He will always win that. And we will gain a sense of endurance and concentration if we do that. A London restaurant owner named Emil Mettler was often visited by Albert Schweitzer. He had a practice that if he knew a person was a Christian, they never paid for their meal at his restaurant. One day, Schweitzer was there and noticed in the till Along with the bills and the coins, there was a six-inch nail. And so he asked Mettler about, what, what, what's the purpose of that? And here was his explanation. I keep this nail with my money to remind me of the price that Christ paid for my salvation and what I owe him in return. What reminders do we have of the suffering of our Savior? Paul told Timothy, you need to remember God's son. Secondly, in these verses, there seems to be an admonition to remember God's word. Paul referenced a time in his life when he was imprisoned. And he tells Timothy, I want you to suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. You look at me, Timothy, and you see what happened is because I stood up for Christ, I ended up incarcerated. But then he says this, but nobody can lock up the word of God. Nobody can imprison God's word. And I need for you to remember, Timothy, that God's word is always free and it is freeing. 
It's never imprisoned. What does it do to you when you get an email or a message or you send one to someone and they don't respond and they don't reply? Or if you're not into that scene, you leave a message on the phone and somebody doesn't call you back. What, what does that do inside of you? I'm going to wager that most of us don't like it much. You know, if, if we took the time to try to notify someone, we'd like to hear that they got the notification. I wonder if we've ever given any thought to how God might feel when we don't respond to his message, to his text, to his phone call, to his email. There, there is so much in Scripture about the uniqueness of the message of God. We're just going to touch the hem of the garment, and most of these will be from Psalms. This is the first Psalm from the New Living. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in, in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless shaft scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the, God, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. There's only two options. Either sin will keep us from the Bible, or the Bible will keep us from sin. You see, God has said his word doesn't come back empty. It doesn't return void. It does one of two things. It either motivates people to serve him and get away from sin, or they choose to reject the message. So sin will either keep you from the Bible, or the Bible will keep you from sin. Almost every verse of Psalm 119 is an expression of how free the word of God is. Just a few of those. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. A heart purpose to God's message produces a keeping of his statutes. When, when I have a desire, a burning desire to what God's message is to me, then my response is I want to do what that God has said to me. Verse 7, I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. The more that we remember God's message, the more of an upright heart will offer praise to God. We continue, verse 28, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. God, God's message, when remembered, provides the greatest pick-me-up there is. Coffee is good, but the Word of God is better. The greatest pick-me-up. Appreciated Bill's class this morning. What I, what I heard Bill telling us is that to rejoice always, I need to stop thinking about when something will happen, and I, start, I need to start thinking that I'm in the Lord. It's not when, it's in. And then that led me to, to think about uh, First uh, Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, where Peter says, you cast your anxieties on God because he cares for you. So I'm in Christ, in the Lord, and I take my anxieties to God. I'm in the Lord. My anxieties go to God. What's the result? The peace that passes all understanding. That's the result. Talk about a pick-me-up. That's all from God's word. God's message gives us that kind of spiritual pick-me-up. Verses 36 and 7. Turn your heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. The greatest motivator against selfish practices is God's message. It will move me from that. The message from God will keep one away from worthless things, 
The word that is used there in the Hebrew is the same word that Solomon uses often in the book of Ecclesiastes when he says vanity of vanities or worthlessness. Uh, it, it, within, within his book, he talks about it being equal to striving after wind. It's just empty. There's nothing involved to it. There isn't anything there. God's word will keep us away from things that don't have any value. Horace Greeley says, it's impossible to mentally or socially enslave a Bible-reading people. The principles of the Bible are the groundwork of human freedom. You can't imprison someone that's spiritually free. That's the power that's in God's message. No wonder Paul says, I need for you to remember God's Son, God's Word. And then lastly... I think within Paul's words, we find how important it is for us to remember God's people. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. What is the first thing that you remember when you think about God's people? What's the first thing that pops into your mind when I say, we need to remember God's people. Well, I think it's going to depend on what we process as being God's people. You know, there are going to be some people that you and I think about that we, we, we will say, oh, these are such godly people. And when we remember them, when we remember those chosen of God whom we consider to be godly people, we will think about things like their love their patience, their faithfulness, their, their loyalty, their service. Those are the kinds of things that we will remember about those people. And it will become a motivation for us. But if we lump everybody into our understanding of God's people, the picture may come up, come up a little different. We may have a tendency <laughs> to wish... God's people were a more limited number. Many of us hold such unachieved expectations of God's people. that When we think of God's people, rather than being motivated by encouragement, we are depressed. <laughs> and this happens so easily. This is one of the tools of Satan. It happens so easily. He is so sly about the way this works. That if we don't make the choice to rejoice, if we don't on purpose make the decision to remember God's people, whoever they are, we will make the mental choice to forget a bunch and wish we could forget more. Now let me, let me just, I'm just going to throw this out as an illustration. Did you notice when you walked into the building this morning, there was a certain aroma? Anybody notice that? Did you get it figured out? You know, the six inches of water the other day, got water in the basement. And probably, you know, it's easy. Man, what smells in here? And so... Here we are, we're walking in to learn of God and to worship God, and the first thing that Satan does is he occupies our minds with a stink. And then we start, well, it smells like something's moldy, something's mildew, something's wet. Oh, I'll bet, some, I'll bet water leaked. Why didn't somebody do something about that? You know, who was supposed to be in charge of wet carpet? Obviously not me, or I'd have done something, but somebody was supposed to be in charge of that, and they didn't do their job, and so, and let's just say that as you walked in, smelled that aroma, and began to think that, then you walked down, because you're a teacher, you walked down into your classroom, and you stepped into your room, and all the chairs are up on the table, and the table, the room's all rearranged, and half the stuff's not there, and you go, who messed with my classroom? Well, the floor obviously got wet and somebody came in here and sucked up the water and they messed up my room and they didn't put it back. 
So now, do you, just see, do you see how Satan's got this thing going? This thing is snowballing, and it just keeps going. That's, by the way, that's the stinking thinking that we're studying on Sunday night. Yeah, and then we're, we're studying how, how God says you get the odor out. Uh, not tonight, but next week. Here's, here's what we need to learn to do. We need to look for what has happened. Do you know that that wet carpet in the basement was a noose around Julie Wallace's neck? What are we going to do? That basement is wet. And Wednesday night, I hadn't been over to the building. Wednesday night, she has spotted this water, and she, there's got to be a plan to deal with this. How many of you appreciate Julie Wallace for doing that? But if all we do is go, something stinks and somebody didn't do something, we don't go there. The only way we get there is by thinking, choosing to think differently. So, thank you, Julie Wallace. Dennis comes. Julie tells Dennis. Dennis, we've got water down here. Don't know what. Dennis comes to me. He says, Julie's going to call the carpet people. I'm in Seward tomorrow. Are you going to be in the office? Yes, I'll be in the office. All of that happened. Two young guys come. Six o'clock. No, it was five o'clock. Five o'clock. Thursday afternoon. They work until 6.30, sucking water out of the basement. Their boss comes the next day, goes down, feels, feels things, says, well, he says, I know it smells a little bit, but he says, when this is all dry, we'll come back, we'll clean the carpet, and we put an enzyme on it, and because there's no pad on it, you know, it shouldn't be a problem, and it should, it should kill all any bacteria, and it should take care of the odor. And we can rejoice in the Lord when we take time to think. But you see, if we don't take time, do you see, do you see how quickly we get captured by that thinking? How easily Satan allows our minds to adopt a philosophy about God's people that is not like Paul's. Paul said he endured all things for the sake of the elect. I think Paul's point to Timothy rises above such personal biases and calls him to practice endurance so that he can personally contribute to the spiritual progress of God's chosen. The idea of endure is that word about being burdened, staying under, uh, having fortitude, and all things in the Greek means all things. There's no exception. It's the whole thing. He endured all things. Paul himself endured for God's people. But you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and in Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered Listen to this gentleman's comments. He says it better than I can about How do you keep from accepting. getting discouraged when it's apparent that so many people just aren't passionate for God and his word? Well, I keep from getting discouraged mainly by not focusing on my people, but focusing on the Lord. And then he gives me the heart for the people. If I were to focus on the world and its condition or the church and its condition, or even my own soul and its condition, I think I would be overcome by discouragement. But that's not where encouragement comes from. We are to draw encouragement mainly from Christ and from his work on the cross and from his resurrection power and from his intercession for us at the Father's right hand and from his promise to work all things together for good. And so it's contemplating Christ, the history of redemption, the work of the cross, the promises of God that establish the heart. So that's the, the fundamental way. And then the second thing is that there are evidences of grace in the church. Even in the weakest saint, there are evidences of grace. And we should give thanks for the smallest evidence that the Holy Spirit has begun a work in our lives. And really, for all of us, that's all he's done. He who began a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Christ. He's just begun. 
And so I would say, look first to Christ. That's my hope. And then look for the evidences of his grace, even in the weakest saint. And you can find them, and you can celebrate them, and bring those people along for it. Isn't that powerful? You give your concentration to remembering Christ, and you get the heart to endure all for God's people. And then you couple that with finding the grace even among the weakest. Powerful. Paul tells Timothy to remember God's people. Your memories. The things we choose to remember will become the motivation of our spiritual walk. That will either lead us in the right direction or the wrong, depending on what we choose to remember. So Paul tells Timothy, I want you to remember God's son. That's what it's all about. Everything's about him and you being in him. I want you to remember God's message, God's word. I want you, Timothy, to take that message and place it above all the turmoil you're going to face as a young preacher. I want you to remember the word of God. And Timothy, I want you to remember God's people. I want you to endure all for the sake of God's elect.